Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today with my following reading recommendations. I was uh, replying to comments in some of my older videos and I was like, I used to hold a cup of coffee in my videos and it was so cozy for me and I think for you, if not, if you're like, thank God she stopped drinking coffee in her videos, sorry. But yeah, I mean, I have this witch's brew mug, which I just thought was appropriate. I have recently become a rep for Fable Grounds Coffee. I have their code in the description of my all my videos, even before telling y'all that was a thing. It was just there. And they have like a bunch of fall coffees that I've been enjoying and getting into the fall spirit. I was like, I need to bring that into the video. Um, I have some new mugs from Creatively Crafts that are kind of fallish. This isn't one of them, but I'll have a Creatively Crafts mug in another video. I just thought witches brew with my sweater and the theme of this video would be appropriate. Anyway, I'm calling this Halloween reading recommendations because I toyed with doing a separate video for fall reading recommendations and for like spooky Halloween reading recommendations. I decided to do them all in one video because I am lazy. <laughs> and because some of them I would have had to spend so long trying to figure out which list it belongs on. Do I put it on both lists? Is this like fall vibes or is this creepy? Does it need to be creepy to be an October like fall spooky read? I don't, it was just too stressful. So I just made one list that I was like, these are books that you read in October and November. Done. I have written it down so that I can read it off and hold my cup of coffee and put up pictures of the books because I cannot be holding this and this and books don't have three arms. That would be nice and creepy for Spooktober or Halloween or whatever the fuck you want to say. Alrighty, I originally had 15 on this list and then I remembered one that I was like, how did I forget that? Um, and it is start at the top of my list, so it is item zero. <laughs> so I guess we'll start there. And that is The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein by Kristen White. Oh, also, I think in the past I've done videos like this before recommending fall, spooky, creepy, etc. type reads. So some of these might be repeats. Uh, I didn't bother checking <laughs> what I said before, so you're welcome. I guess seeing it on here means I just still think. It's a great read and I still think it's a good Halloween read. Okay, yeah, so back to Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein by Kristen White. This is just one of my all-time favorite books. It didn't make my all-time favorite books of all time video because I had to narrow it to 10 for some reason that I arbitrarily decided. It's such, oh my God, it's such a good book. I mean, if you've read, did I put Frankenstein on the list? Did I not? Why did I put Frankenstein on the list? Okay, well, I guess now there's 17 books because also Frankenstein. Um, I really love Frankenstein uh, by Mary Shelley. I read it twice I think. I've, I've read it twice. I've seen the play like three times, three and a half, and then I've read The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein. I think I like The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein more than Frankenstein, but the one is not possible without the other and so, and I think the one is improved by the other. So, uh, because if you're only familiar with Frankenstein in the like, you know, laboratorial zipper neck kind of way, that is not Frankenstein. So one, you need to read Frankenstein so that you are disabused of this notion. And two, it is the real authentic original Mary Shelley Frankenstein that Kirsten White is playing off of, is, is messing with and is altering and yeah, retelling, I guess. Retelling, that's the word. I, I don't, you can't not read, is that can't not? I hate double negatives. Okay, you don't have to have read Frankenstein, I don't think, to understand and appreciate Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein. But I think if it's like a 1 to 10 scale that I've decided to use for this question, even though I never rate books on a 10 scale, I think if you read Dark Descent without having read or without being familiar with the original Frankenstein, it would be around like the 6 to 7 mark because you'd be like, that was, that was really good, but like it was fine. But if you've read the real Frankenstein, it's like 11 out of 10. Oh, so good. So good. Like the original Frankenstein, again, I like it a lot. I think it's amazing for its time and like historically speaking like discussing like the progress of women in literature and like the genesis of this genre at all like Frankenstein is just like fucking Frankenstein but it is older and Mary Shelley is a product of her own time so that bleeds into the text some cultural social mores some biases just the nature of the way it's told is wordier a little slower a little more on the philosophizing less on the driving creepy plot it's still excellent it still holds up in my opinion but Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein is told by a modern author while still paying great respect to the original. So it is, she's a little better for a modern audience to have this like spooky, creepy, edgier seat type of narrative. Even though you would think if you've read the real Frankenstein, you know already what Elizabeth doesn't know, which is, I think, so cool. Because Elizabeth Frankenstein, it's all told from her perspective. 
So she obviously doesn't know, it doesn't occur to her that Victor has reanimated human flesh because that doesn't really tend to occur to people as an option about what someone's up to. So watching her put the pieces together is so much darker and more satisfying when you know. And watching her figure it out and then watching her decide what to do with that knowledge once she has figured it out and just like her relationship with Victor. In the original, it's it's very simple. It's very, she's just like the girl he grew up with. She's a plot device more than a character. But telling it from her perspective, like it's, oh, it's a genius move. I didn't mean for this whole video to be about Dark Side of the Frankenstein. I don't think I ever posted a review for it when I read it, which is a mistake. Maybe I'll reread it this year. No, I can't because I have a TBR that's like insanely long. Anyway. Yeah, so Dark Descent Elizabeth Frankenstein. If you take nothing else from this list, read that, but only if you've read the real Frankenstein, and if not, take those two from this list. Read Frankenstein and then read The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein. Chef's kiss. Next on my list is Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lenia Taylor, one that I'm not sure you would have expected. I don't know what y'all expected. Maybe you're like, of course, it's on the list. I don't know. I shouldn't presume. Oh my god, I forgot another one from this list. What am I doing? Why even have a list? Oh god. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully I'll remember, but no, I've committed to talking about Daughter of Smoke and Bone, so we're doing that first. Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lady Taylor is such an amazing book, but it's also got this like creepy dark weather, mysterious supernatural goings on type vibes. It takes place in Prague in the modern day at first at least. And it's got, there's this uh, this restaurant or this cafe that uh, that Karu and her friend Susanna, Zuzana go to, they frequent. It's got like gas masks and everything because it's playing off of the World War II vibes. It serves goulash, like the best goulash in Prague. I forget the name of the cafe. I remember it being kind of a macabre kind of name for the cafe. Anyway, so the, all of that and then like the magical creatures that come into it are also kind of a little creepy, a little unnerving in their aesthetic. And the story is just so dark and twisty and beautiful and magical and one of the best things I've ever read. Um, the back of the international edition is blurred by Patrick Rothfuss and the, the blurb is just, I wish I had written this book from Patrick Roth. So let's, yeah, just fucking, fucking read it. Um, okay, before I go to the next on my list, actually, no, the next on my list is Name of the Wind, and I did just mention Patrick Rothfuss, so let's fucking do it. <laughs> Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, I, I feel like even if you haven't read it, if you've seen the cover, you're like, this looks like a fall book, and you would be right. I like the US cover that's kind of blue tones with the, like shadowy dementor looking figure. It gives you more of the sense of the slightly creepy quality of some of the aspects of the story, whereas the UK cover with the like, orange and green gives you more like the fall vibes of the book. Both are accurate, both are true. So it's got sort of like creepy monstrous figures in it that is good for like the spooky part of the season, but it's also got you know taverns and cider and all of that kind of thing in a university that teaches magic. Like what's more fall than that? We're not reading Harry Potter anymore because we are not reading Harry Potter anymore. Read Name of the Wind if you haven't already, like do it. Okay, circling back to the one that I remembered while I was sitting here reviewing my list going, why is that not on here? The Woman in Black by Susan Hill? <laughs> it's not on my list. I'm not sure, but yeah. I'm pretty sure it's Susan Hill. It's very short, very creepy, very dark. Uh, it's like on the side of like horror. Is it? I don't know. It's, it's, it's creepy to me. <laughs> Gothic horror. So you've got this like haunted house that's being haunted by the woman in black. The man that goes to visit it is it's completely remote and isolated and, and it can't be reached other than by this causeway that gets, gets covered by water at night so you can't even leave. And this guy trying to figure out, he's just trying to sort out the papers of the person that used to live there but it's like obviously being haunted and oh, it's just so atmospheric and so spooky. And if you have a chance to see the play, I highly recommend the play. The play is so cool and I screamed. I literally screamed in an actual theater. Next on my list is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I feel like in general, Dark Academia is, I don't need to explain why that is a good Halloween type of read. The academic setting always put, I mean, September, October is back to school season. So it puts you in mind of an academic setting or the academic setting puts you in mind of back to school season, whichever way you want to say it. But it's also a really dark story about students covering, like working together and covering up the collective murder of one of their group and you don't know why. And it's so deliciously dark and so pretentious. So really like this is the season to be wearing 
like cardigans and to be having wood paneling around and stuff. The scent of tobacco wafting in the air. So it's the it's the time of year you want to read something equally pretentious. So read The Secret History by Donna Tartt. Uh, next on my list is This Savage Song by Victoria Schwab. Uh, I feel like I probably put this on a list before. It's kind of a dystopian, a near future dystopian, where monstrous deeds manifest themselves in actual physical living entities. <laughs> There's three different kinds of monster. So that you follow two main characters and one of the main characters, her father, is sort of like in charge of defeating all these monsters and protecting the city. And he's kind of not a, not a good dad. <laughs> and then the other main character, main POV character, is a monster. Is, is one of these beings that was, whose origin is the sin of another person and it's such a unique idea for a story and like I don't I feel like just telling you that premise you'd be like yeah well of course that's a, a following <laughs> reading work. I think it's really cool it's um kind of a slower book like it took me at least 100 pages to really get into it but when I did I, I did. The duology is called The Monsters of Verity. It's really good in general but I feel like it's a good one for the season. Next on my list is Blackwing by Ed McDonald. This has made a few lists. I don't think I ever did a dedicated review. I don't know why I don't do dedicated reviews for books that I love. But the entire Raven's Mark trilogy is amazing. But yeah, so Blackwing by Ed McDonald is criminally underrated. It, I've mentioned it a few times, so you probably recognize it if you've watched me for a while. But it takes place in this sort of very industrial, nuclear fallout vibes kind of setting with these monsters that are shaped by this sort of fallout zone. This po The very air is poisonous. The creatures in it are like kind of grotesque and terrifying and our main character kind of part of his job is ferrying people across this wasteland called the misery our main character himself he works for one of the nameless which are sort of these godlike entities and his boss his sort of avatar is a, a blackbird a, is it a crow or raven i get them mixed up but he's got a tattoo of one on his arm to mark him as a servant of the nameless but in order for him to get instructions from his boss an actual physical live bird bloodily explodes out of Ryholt Galharo's arm when his boss has a message for him. And like, it's not like a magical, like, a bird appeared. Like, it crawls out of and explodes out of his arm. And then his arm heals, which is the part that's kind of magical because that should like ruin your arm. It heals up, okay, but the experience is like a normal bird exploding out of your arm as if it wasn't magical. <laughs> So I mean, every time you complain about emails from work in your future life, just be grateful you don't have a raven bloodily exploding out of your arm. Email doesn't seem so bad now, does it? Next on my list is The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. This list, oh, I have another Neil Gaiman on this list. I also put in tiny writing next to The Graveyard Book, I put also anything by Neil Gaiman. So The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman is a retelling of The Jungle Book, but instead of a boy in a jungle, it's a boy in a graveyard. And instead of him being raised by the animals of the jungle, there he's raised by ghosts and goblins and ghouls that inhabit said graveyard. And it's exactly as like strangely charming and creepily heartwarming as you would expect from that premise and from that author. And I didn't ex I expected to love it because Neil Gaiman is my favorite author. But I didn't expect or wasn't prepared for how emotional I would feel reading it. And not the whole time, but like at the end of the book, I, like, I legit teared up. And I was just like, oh, what is happening? <laughs> Again, it's about a little boy being raised in a graveyard and his guardians are ghosts, ghouls, and goblins. And then the reason that like sort of, I guess, the, the sheer Khan type character in it is so creepy to me. I mean, I don't really read horror, so I mean, I'm a wimp. But... It's, this is a kid's book. This is middle grade. And the man Jack, who is basically the Shere Khan character, creeps me the fuck out. So just saying. I'm just saying. Uh, I guess we'll just skip ahead to my other Neil Gaiman because why split them up? But my next Neil Gaiman recommendation is one that I've, I don't think I've ever talked about on my channel before other than maybe in like a wrap up or something. And that is Truth is a Cave in the Black Mountains. This is a really short picture book, but I highly, highly, highly highly recommend the audiobook. I mean the you should also get the picture book so you can look at the pictures as you go. But the audiobook is is told is uh, read by Neil Gaiman, which is true of uh, probably the majority of Neil Gaiman's audiobooks are read by Neil Gaiman. Not all, but a lot. Anyway, so it's read by Neil Gaiman, but there's a string quartet that actually like write wrote and like plays music throughout this sort of haunting kind of dark music. And it's really short because I mean it's a picture book. So the audiobook is uh, 
two hours maybe maybe three hours it, it can't be it's definitely not longer than three hours i don't even think it is three hours i think it's two maybe even one i don't it's really it's really short but it's so atmospheric and dark and it just has the feeling of this like old tale this this older than the earth and it's I don't really have words for it. It's but it's so gaming, and I love it. And I've listened to it several times because it's it's short. So it's like watching it's like the length of a movie, you know. So instead of watching a movie, I just listen to "Truth Is a Cave in the Black Mountains." It's oh, it's so so good. Highly recommend. Next on my list is Ninth House" by Lee Bardugo. I do have a review on my channel for Ninth House," which the thumbnail I think would make you think that I hated it. <laughs> Oops, but I, I didn't hate it. Uh, I thought it the beginning was hurting itself. I feel like it was really hard to get into and I struggled to get into it and I think that's not my fault. I identified in that video some reasons that I think some ways that I think some choices that were made by Lee Bardugo and how she was going to be introducing this world and introducing these characters to us that I was just like why? You could have done it this way and it would have been instantly more engaging and interesting for the reader. Why wouldn't you do that? But no one asked me. <laughs> and I'm not a professional author, so whatever, whatever. But yeah, if you didn't know, Ninth House is Lee Bardugo's first adult novel. It is Dark Academia, but unlike other Dark Academia, such as The Secret History by Donna Tartt, Ninth House does have fantastical, supernatural elements in it. It's not just straight up an academic setting with realistic people and realistic events going on. It's not that. So if you went into it expecting it to be a little more like The Secret History, it is not. <laughs> there is very, like, it's not even just like, is this possibly mad? It's like 100% definitely magical. Page one tells you this is magical. Oh, okay. It takes place in Yale and it has to do with the secret societies at Yale, which the secret societies, that's a thing that's real. Like there really are secret societies in Yale and Lee Bardugo based this on her own experience at Yale because she went to Yale and was, this is what inspired this. She just took the idea of these secret societies and was like, what if they did magic, supernatural, creepy, dark, demonic stuff. <laughs> okay. And there you have Ninth House. Ninth House is the first book in a series. I have heard conflicting reports as to how many books are going to be in this series. It is very dark. It is very triggering. It is very, very R-rated. <laughs> like if you're worried about that kind of thing, if you don't just dive into just about anything, like if there are certain things you avoid, if you know that about yourself, check out what people have posted for trigger warnings, etc. Because the, it's in there. <laughs> if you don't worry about that kind of thing, like, don't worry about it. But it's it's all, there's a lot of things like that in there that be mindful of. Again, I think the start, the beginning is so slow and I think that could have been avoided. But once I got into it, I was into it. And I think the, again, the dark academia setting add to that, the demonic supernatural, of course, that's a good fall spooktober, a Halloween time read. I don't need to explain why that fits this time of year. Next on my list is Silver in the Wood by, oh god, I didn't write down the author and I don't remember. Well, I'm assuming I put a picture up so y'all can tell me who the author is. Whoopsie doopsie. Anyway, um, it is really, really short. It is a novella, technically, I think. I don't really always, I'm, I'm not always clear on what defines, is it length only that makes something a novella? I don't know. It is, I think, a novella and it is part of a duology. The second one just came out. I have it on my Kindle have not read it yet. But Silver in the Wood is basically like a queer Tom Bombadil in a, a dark forest that's like akin to Uprooted, but like if Uprooted was good. Spoilers, I hated Uprooted. But uh, you know how in Uprooted the forest is like this really dark creepy place? If that had been done well I would have been all about. Well the Silver in the Wood, and I actually saw the author of Silver in the Wood say something about how she loves Uprooted and it's kind of like Uprooted and I was just like, oh honey, but you did so much better than Uprooted. So the author herself compares it to Uprooted and I would say that's a fair comparison. It's just way better. It's really short and really atmospheric and I kind of ate it up because it just kind of sucks you right in. And it's a short read. You can read it in one sitting. I highly recommend. Next on my list is one that will probably surprise everybody and that's Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. I'll give you a minute. Despite the vitriol thrown my way, I don't hate everything Sanderson has ever written and I did not hate Mistborn. I hated, I hate's a strong word, I, I had extreme issues with how Mistborn the trilogy ended. I have a video on it, 
and uh, people hate me for that video, <laughs> whatever. I do think Mistborn, like the first two books, I loved them. And I fully expected to love the trilogy and for it to be a favorite trilogy. The ending really soured me, but not like Dark Dawn. Dark Dawn literally ruined all of Nevernight for me and I hate Nevernight. I unhauled all my Nevernight books, so fuck that. <laughs> the end of Mistborn didn't do that. It did not completely ruin the first two books for me. I still like the first two books. I'm just a little less keen. <laughs> than I was when I went into it because now I know where this is all going and I got issues with it. But anyway, um, yeah, so if you don't know, <laughs> Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson, the three books, The Final Empire, The Well of Ascension, and The Hero of Ages. Well of Ascension, oh, 10 out of 10. But Final Empire, the first book, I quite liked. I think I gave it four to five stars. And it's this what if the Dark Lord won is kind of the premise and it takes place in this really dark, like the fantasy version of Gotham. <laughs> it's like always dark, there's ash falling from the sky all the time, which like honestly living in California right now, I'm just like, Mistborn. <laughs> it's a really hard magic system, which Brandon Sanderson is known for. It's to do with ingesting metals and people who have the ability to do things with those metals, then using the metals that they have ingested to achieve different magical results. Mistings can do this with one kind of metal, Mistborn can do it with all the metals, hence the name of the series. But the, again, the whole vibe of it is this sort of like dark ash falling from the sky, the Dark Lord is in charge. I mean, it's honestly feeling quite relevant these days. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, so it's it's just got those dark vibes. And then the story itself, the first book at least, is kind of a heist story, which I like heist stories. I know a lot of people don't, but I also weirdly think that heist stories are good fall reads because I just feel like the idea of like a group getting together to like pour over plans and documents and scheme that feels like a fall activity because <laughs> that's what we all do in fall you know we carve jack-o-lanterns and and we plot heists <laughs> <laughs> it's just how it feels to me though. So maybe it's kind of like one step removed from dark academia where I just, it's sort of like an academic endeavor when you have to do so much research and planning. It's like a group project to steal a thing or to kill someone. So yeah, I do recommend uh, Mistborn for the fall. And generally I recommend Mistborn. So all y'all people who want to murder me for not liking the end, calm down. Uh, next on my list is My Plain Jane by a trio of authors, Cynthia Hand, Shodi Meadows, and Brody Ashton? Oh, did I remember them all? Oh my god, I'm so proud of me unless I'm wrong, in which case don't tell me. They have a, a, a series, I think it's just a trilogy, I have all three. I've only read My Plain Jane, but each one is a retelling of a Jane of some kind. So the first one was My Lady Jane, which is about Lady Jane Grey. I haven't read it, but that's what the first one was. The third one that just came out that I have not read is about Calamity Jane. So My Plain Jane is about Jane Eyre, which actually like occurs to me that it's the only of the three that is not about a real person. Because Lady Jane Grey was a real person, Calamity Jane was a real person, but Jane Eyre was not. But My Plain Jane is focused, I don't remember if she's just like a really main character or if she is the uh, POV character, but it focuses a lot on Charlotte Bronte who's in it. It's that Charlotte Bronte and Jane Eyre are friends and like the implication is that, that Charlotte Bronte was inspired by the events of this book to write Jane Eyre, except we added in it's like Jane Eyre meets Ghostbusters. <laughs> and it's really like funny, like it's not intended to be taken seriously. So I don't mind that it's being absurd because it's not, it doesn't take itself remotely seriously. Again, like there's like a literal ghost. It's like a friend and then she can see ghosts. So I guess it's like the sixth sense. And there's, they're like trying, there's like a secret society that they want Jane to be a part of or they want Charlotte to be a part of. I forget which is which because they're kind of together all the time. But they, they, they want to be a part of, they want them to be a part of to like, catch ghosts and that's why they go end up in Thornfield Hall in the first place because there's like a ghost paranormal situation thing we need to get do reconnaissance on like it's just like a fun quirky spooky ghost filled story that isn't scary it's not remotely scary it's just a lot of fun especially if you've read Jane Eyre there's like a lot of little nods to Jane Eyre and just little nods to just the Brontes in general I just thought it was a lot of fun like it's not like great literature but it's a good time Next on my list is The Seven Deaths of Evil in Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. I, n I didn't write down any of the author names if that hasn't become apparent, so whoops. Anywho, this is a book that I did actually maybe post a review for. It's been a while. And I, once again, had issues with the ending, but not so much that I wouldn't recommend it. I just think if you're gonna read it, know that, in my opinion, the ending, like, it, the, the, the nature of the premise of the book makes that it's really it's gonna, always going to be an ending that's it's a really hard landing to stick and I'm not sure that he did stick the landing but I kind of don't blame him because what he set up there 
while I was reading it, I was just like, how are you gonna end this, bro? But I should probably tell you what it's about so that you can appreciate what I'm saying. So the premise, if you don't know, of The Seven Deaths of Evil in Hardcastle, which they changed the name in the US to The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evil in Hardcastle because Americans are too stupid to know that it's a different book from The Seven Husbands of Evil in Hugo. So adding a half to it, that fixes it. Like if they think we're too dumb to see the difference, I don't know why adding a half would help. You know what I mean? Like maybe we are too dumb, but that's certainly not going to make the difference. The Seven Deaths of Evil in Hardcastle is a closed circle, isolated, like fancy house murder mystery, which isn't all that original as a concept. However, it's like Groundhog Day because our main character, he or she doesn't know who he or she are. They just, they are sentient and inhabiting the body of one of the people at this house until they realize that they are waking up each day experiencing the same day over again as a different person in that house, experiencing this day of the murder of Evil in Hardcastle as a different person. So they get a different perspective on the day that, that she died. And so the person needs to solve the murder and the person themselves, they don't know who they are or were before they started waking up at the bodies of these people. They just exist now in these different bodies and whoever they were before has been erased from their memory. So again, you don't know if it's a he or a she or a they or, or what, but they're waking up in these different bodies and you don't know how they ended up there, why they ended up there, who put them there. <laughs> but this is what's happening. They're waking up in these different bodies on the day of the murder and reliving the day of the murder over and over from the perspective of a different person who was there, which is a concept like, wowza, Groundhog Day meets Gosford Park. Like, hello, yes, I'm here for that. But again, because of the premise that I just explained to you, like that's a really bizarre premise. And of course the audience, in addition to wanting to know who killed Evelyn Hardcastle, which is the what an audience wants in every whodunit, is to know also the mystery of who this person is and why they have this mission with this quest, this supernatural like thing happening to them. And that's the part that's really hard to stick the landing on. And again, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a better idea of how they could have stuck the landing, but I'm not the author. So uh, I, the way it ended, I was just like, uh, okay, I had my druthers and I wasn't awful, but like, ugh. so if you go into it, don't expect too much from the answer to the question of why this person is waking up in these different bodies. But overall, the experience of it is quite atmospheric, especially if you like watching like all those like BBC masterpiece theater, close circle whodunit type things, Gosford Park and Miss Marple and Poirot and all that kind of thing. It's an eerie close circle mystery with this added supernatural element. So it's a very spooky atmospheric book, which I think is great for the season. The next book on my list is Deathless Girls by, God damn it, I didn't write down the author. Mm, well, I'm guessing you know, cause I'm guessing I put it right here. Anyway, Deathless Girls is uh, a retelling or a uh, the imagining or whatever, but it's about Dracula's wives. And I don't like Dracula, the original Dracula. I hate Dracula a lot, <laughs> but I like, so unlike Dark Descent was with Frankenstein, where I was just like, Frankenstein is great and this is even better. Fucking hate Dracula. But this book, it's a very like feminist, queer, dark, earthy, ancient feeling story that I just, it's mainly a, a vibe. It's a mood and the book itself is gorgeous. And I just feel like that's the experience of reading this book. It's, I mean, there is a plot and it is to do with how they become the like brides of Dracula. But the experience of reading it is more just kind of like sinking into this world and into the experience, the lived experience of these characters, which is not a happy one, <laughs> but it's just, it's very much atmospheric. It's kind of like if you've ever seen Crimson Peak, the way I feel about Crimson Peak, the movie, is that it's less to do like my enjoyment of it is less to do with the plot or the characters. It's more just like existing in the world of Crimson Peak, the vibe, the aesthetic, the mood. Deathless Girls is kind of like that to me, where it's this, the book is a mood. So yeah, I just feel like if you feel like existing in this dark Eastern European, creepy, vampiric world <laughs> for a bit, I recommend. Next on my list is Deathless. <laughs> Not Deathless Girls, but Deathless by Catherine Valenti. I love this book and it is oh, it's so good. I heard a lot of praise for it. Uh, so I was kind of like, when I went to it, I was just like, there's no way it can live up. And it kind of fucking did. Okay, so what is it? It's about Kostya the Deathless, which is a figure from Russian folklore. And like, it's taking the, it's a basically a retelling of the story of Maria Morevna and Kostya the Deathless, which are again, figures from Russian folklore, but it's blending it with like, with Russian history. So you've got like Stalinist house elves while you also have like actually Kostya the Deathless showing up 
and it's just blending it so seamlessly to where it feels like this ancient old mythic story but also historical fiction and you don't know where the line is and you're not meant to know where the line is there is no line it's oh it's just so delicious and it's i mean Kostje and maria's relationship is is so toxic and so not healthy but it's all it's just this like dark deliciously velvety story that i just ate it up i am eastern of eastern european descent myself so my my sensibilities lie that way anyway so i'm just naturally more interested in it i grew up on russian fairy tales in addition to latvian fairy tales that aesthetic that vibe calls to me so i'm obviously inclined towards it but it's just it's so well done it's so well done like oh and the prose is just luscious oh so good next on my list is a book that i forgot to put on my list <laughs> When I was looking at it, I was like, God damn it, I didn't put that on the list either. And that is The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston LaRue. People hate this book. <laughs> I read it like three or four times in high school. I loved it. It's a, a classic that even, um, even Andrew Lloyd Webber kind of low-key hates it. That's why he changed it so much for his version, which is the version that everyone now knows. So it's just like, fuck you, Gaston LaRue. People know Phantom of the Opera from my musical, not from your actual story, which, um, I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, I love the musical too. It's not like I don't. But the original book, again, I read it like three or four times. It's this old, creepy, gothic story. I don't know why people hate it. I don't. So basically, if you're familiar with the musical, it's not vastly different from it. It is basically that plot where there is this man who's sort of like haunting the bowels of the opera house. And he's in love with this young ingenue named Christine Daae. And there's a rich dude who wants to marry Christine. And this monster who, who haunts the opera house is jealous and calls him problems. <laughs> so like that is still the plot. It's not like it's not the plot. <laughs> but there's just more to it. And the Phantom himself, like he was pr very much prettified for the musical. He's got like a death's head. Like he looks like a skeleton. His entire his skin is like parchment and falling off of him. He looks like the Horned King, minus the horns from the Black Cauldron. He's not like Michael Crawford or Jared Butler. He is literally the stuff of nightmares. So it makes sense more so than in, because I mean, the way he's portrayed in the stage musical and in the movie is just like, he's like a burn victim. But like, this is all very attractive. <laughs> nope. I, I don't think that, I don't know the guest on the route had any particular condition in mind when he wrote this character. I don't know that it's referencing a, an actual medical condition, but he's, he's not looking good. <laughs> and he is a genius. And so that's lip service is painted that in the musical again, where they say that he's a genius. And like, it's implied that like, obviously he's able to haunt the opera house so effectively because he must be a genius. But it, the book really goes into it and about how he learned his craft and the it really paints him as this kind of it's, it's both more and less sympathetic to the phantom than the musical the music just romanticizes the phantom the book doesn't romanticize the phantom but it is oddly more sympathetic to the phantom because it's definitely the it's kind of akin to frankenstein and this sort of if you treat someone like a monster then they become a monster kind of narrative and then again the the setting of the opera house and i love it <laughs> People who hate it, I don't, I don't understand what your problem is. What were you expecting? <laughs> it's great and I recommend it. All right, last on my list is a book that's actually on my list and that is House of Salt and Sorrow by, god damn it, who wrote it? Uh, Aaron A. Craig, books up there. This book I like way more than I expected to because a lot of hyped YA, 90% of the time lets me down. So I just go into it going like, well, I'm gonna hate it, but let's find out. I really liked it. And I maybe it was helped by the fact that I went into it with like bottom of the barrel expectations. I was just like, I'm gonna hate it, but let's do it. And then because it surpasses expectations and I ended up loving it. If I went into it with high expectations, I don't know that I would have loved it, but I would have still liked it. I'm pretty confident. It's a, a less frequently seen retelling. It's a retelling of the 12 Dancing Princesses which again, I, I don't think I've ever read a retelling of the 12 Dancing Princesses other than that. But it was kind of one of my favorite fairy tales when I was a kid. And House of Salt and Sorrow, it takes place in this, I don't, I don't think it might be an island, but it's definitely on the coast. So there's like a lot of, um, it's a, a spooky that I don't think of that often, but it is obviously very spooky. Um, I usually think of spooky as like in a rural countryside or a forest or mountains or the moors, so like very inland where like, there's ghosts or something. It doesn't occur to me, but it should. And this book has it. The very like ghostly nature of like lighthouses and 
being near the water and like that is also very creepy and this book is so atmospheric it's so atmospheric and it literally creeped me out of it i mean i was by myself house sitting in a house that had no internet <laughs> so i was reading it like in utter silence completely isolated with no internet <laughs> so like that's probably like also helped me with being creeped out but there were definitely moments in it where i was just like oh this is like actually kind of freaking creepy it's a standalone which is refreshing because most ya books in particular and fantasy in general is a monstrously long series that you have to try to keep up with it's a standalone the the romance in it is like i think the weak point in it uh it was kind of thrown in there it felt like it was thrown in there because like the publisher was like you can't have a ya fantasy without romance <laughs> the author was like go so that seemed a little shoved in there but the rest of it oh, i ate it up it was so creepy and dark and atmospheric and mysterious and cool and i've overhyped it now you're gonna hate it but if you were avoiding it because you're just like just another ya fantasy i would say check it out because i think it's better than most that i've picked up recently and that finally does it for both what i wrote down and what i thought of while i was going through what i wrote down <laughs> let me know in the comments down below if you have any particular favorites for the season if any of the books that i listed are on your list of favorites for the season if you've read any of these books before if you want to read these books if uh you know whatever you want to let me know i post videos on saturdays for sure and other random times but definitely saturdays so like and subscribe and i'll see you when i see you